Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar entitled Testing a New Paradigm of Parkinson's Disease and Transforming the Clinical Experience. My name is Janine Falinski, and I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is being recorded, and we will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with your colleagues. We also invite your questions via the interaction panel on the right of your webinar screen. If you think of a question at any point during the presentation, please add it there and we'll hold it for our Q&A portion at the end of the event. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Gary Zamet, President and CEO of ClinLabs Drug Development Corporation. The floor is yours, Gary. Thank you, Janine, and hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Jonathan Sackner Bernstein, who will be talking to us about um, innovative models in Parkinson's disease. Um, before we get into the presentation, the formal presentation, Jonathan, could you give us a little bit of background about yourself personally and your organization? Absolutely, thank you, Gary and Janine. I appreciate the chance to be part of this. Um, I, I started my professional career as an academic cardiologist, primarily in the Columbia system here in New York, uh, and was soon drawn uh, to the, the, the side of industry and drug development and device development and took a position working with Gary and Janine at ClinLabs for several years before moving to the FDA where I served in a senior position in the Center for Devices uh, as the number two person there. Uh, subsequently, I worked as a consultant for DARPA as they initially launched the Biological Technologies Office and since then have been working uh, at, at several startups, as well as as a consultant on regulatory and clinical operations. Thank you. So how does a cardiologist make his way to the study of Parkinson's disease? Yeah, I'd like to say it was a straight line, but uh, it certainly was not. Um, uh, uh, I will admit that I was not somebody in medical school who was focused on inspired by or um, really facile at the neurosciences. Um, as you can imagine, most cardiologists are not. Um, my, uh, my tie to Parkinson's really started when I started to watch a close buddy of mine dwindle with the disease. And when you have a, a friend who's in need, of course, you think about ways you can try to help uh, for someone like me who loves science, I thought, well, let me see if I can figure out a way to help Ivan. So I started to read, study, teach myself. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to come up with this paradigm that I'll share with you today in time to help Ivan. But I know that he would have wanted me to, to passionately pursue it. And that's what I've been doing for the last several years. And I believe that the opportunity to tame Parkinson's is right here, right now which um, would be a, a, a real change from the standard approach that's been really a palliative approach since the 1970s. Well, thank you. We're very excited to learn about the paradigm that you're going to be discussing and really looking forward to your presentation. So with, uh, without further ado, thank you so much for being here today, Jonathan, and um, I'll turn the audience over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gary, once again. So what I'm going to talk about today is how we can simultaneously test a new paradigm of, of Parkinson's disease while transforming the clinical experience for those affected by the disease, by which I mean to include both those who have it and those who are living with them and watching it. I think what's without doubt is that Parkinson's really is an epidemic that is without adequate treatments. Since the 1970s, the goal of therapy has been to increase dopamine in the brain. But as we all know, this does not prevent disease worsening. So clearly, this is not simply a disease of dopamine deficiency. It's either not a disease of dopamine deficiency 
or it's a disease of abnormal dopamine control. And that was the initial observation that I started to chase. We, we know if we've ever seen somebody with Parkinson's uh, who we know or cared for them, that uh, the experience with Parkinson's appears hopeless for an individual, uh, a family, and from a public health perspective. Since 1990, Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurologic disease, according to the Global Burden of Disease Studies. The prevalence has increased 118% and deaths 150% since 1990. A common belief, as I said before, is that Parkinson's disease uh, is a disease where patients are dopamine deficient. But as I said, replacing dopamine does not fix the disease. Dopamine therapies used uh, today are used despite not knowing neuronal dopamine levels. And this is really critical because neuronal dopamine content is related to the toxicity to the neurons. And that relates to both oxidized and metabolized forms of dopamine. And about this, there's no controversy. They affect mitochondrial function, mitochondrial viability, the vesicle formation that is used to sequester dopamine and make sure that its toxicity to cells does not get out of control. All of those processes start to go by the wayside because of dopamine metabolites and oxidized dopamine. What we recently published was the first report of what the average dopamine levels are in dopaminergic neurons. So the key thing here is that if you go back to the original publications that most people in the Parkinson's field really have not read in detail, and I know that seems like a strong statement, but the fact is that of the first four papers, the landmark papers published by the Swiss group in the early 1960s, they're in German. So while it's easy to look at the tables and figure out what the dopamine levels are in the caudate and putamen in normals versus Parkinson's and conclude that they're five to 10% of normal in Parkinson's, uh, if you look at the methods and translate that into English, what you learn is that that's a total brain homogenate content as opposed to what the neurons are actually experiencing. Dopamine is toxic inside the neurons, so we need to know what's inside the neurons. And as we published in the Journal of Parkinson's Disease this past summer, in the caudate, the average neuronal dopamine level in the cytosol is 87% higher than normal. And in the putamen, it's 360% higher than normal. So this is the first report of what's going on inside the cells. And what we now know is Parkinson's is not a state of dopamine deficiency, but rather a state of dopamine excess within the dopaminergic neurons, which exposes them to ongoing toxicity. So these are the uh, results of the uh, uh, study that was published in Journal of Parkinson's Disease. You see it's sort of the, the normal plots. To highlight it, here are the results at the bottom. And you see the, uh, the ratios uh, between of Parkinson's to normal 1.87 and 4.61 with the putamen highly statistically significant. The value proposition of the new therapeutic that I'm proposing using is relates to the fact that while there are hundreds of compounds under investigation, only RB190 addresses the so cellular and cytosolic dopamine overload that we've identified. RB190 is phase two ready. It's a small molecule that was first approved in 1979 when Merck uh, presented it to the FDA for the treatment of hypertensive crisis or hypertensive emergency for patients with a dopamine surge based on having pheochromocytoma. Uh, so it worked relatively well. Uh, it's not even the first line therapy for that problem anymore. Um, it certainly would have been an orphan indication if uh, it had been, uh, if there had been such a designation at that point in time. 
But the key is that this is a drug that's been on the market for 30 years without a significant adverse event profile reported based on queries with the company that owns it now, Bausch Health, based on queries with the FDA's MAW database, so um, uh, FAIRS database. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a drug that is safe from the perspective of unanticipated effects, um, and it's basically ready to go into phase two. The addressable market for this repurposed drug is over a billion dollars based on the IP covering, uh, uh, which is under review by the USPTO and by uh, the European authority and the Chinese authorities. Um, I'll get back to this market opportunity uh, later in the presentation. So RB190, what does it do? How does it address the cause of dopaminergic neuron death? Well, RB190 is a, a relatively boring kind of compound. It's an old fashioned kind of compound because it's an enzyme inhibitor. So we're familiar with enzyme inhibitors, tried and true. Most antibiotics affect rate limiting enzyme for bacterial um, viability. You've got the statins, HMG coase reductase inhibitors. You've got uh, Viagra and similar ED drugs blocking an enzyme of a rate that rate limiting enzyme of a known metabolic pathway is a, a very well understood approach. And RB190 does this. It basically blocks reversibly at a maximum of 65% inhibition of the rate limiting enzyme of dopamine synthesis. It gets into the brain. It gets into these neurons. We know this already from clinical data. And what it does once it's in there is it improves cell biology and viability. There are three preclinical studies using RB190 uh, that have been published, two of which are relatively recent, and I would qualify them as very sophisticated using Parkinson's models. What do they show? They show that oxidized dopamine is significantly reduced. As I mentioned, oxidized dopamine and dopamine metabolites are the, the compounds that are toxic to these dopaminergic neurons. What's more remarkable is that um, by blocking uh, dopamine synthesis, alpha synuclein deposition is significantly reduced. So you have less oxidized dopamine, less alpha synuclein deposition. It's probably not a surprise, but it's nice to see the data from two models that show that neuron viability is significantly enhanced. RB190, as I mentioned, is an existing compound. It, its a generic name is metyrosine. Its chemical name is alpha-methyl-p-tyrosine. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, barrier, reversibly inhibiting the rate-limiting enzyme for dopamine synthesis in the dopaminergic neurons. It does block dopamine synthesis systemically as well, um, which is how it affects blood pressure. But going back to the, those original studies, it's relatively modest or um, more, bl more bluntly weak as an antihypertensive. The original approval, as I mentioned, was from 1979. And a method of use patent is under review, um, which most people don't realize is as potent as a composition of matter patent to block competitors. A method of use patent, uh, along with FDA regulations, mean that the FDA will not consider a review of another uh, submission of a metyrosine preparation for Parkinson's disease because the method of use patent says that the FDA can't. Um, based on a, a conservative timeline, uh, there should be at least eight years of market exclusivity based just on this initial method of use patent uh, which we project should be um, issued by the first quarter of next year. The go-to-market plan to both test the hypothesis that this is a state of dopamine overload, as well as determine the safety and effectiveness of using RB190 as a, a, a treatment, starts with phase two clinical trials uh, that would demonstrate first the tolerability of dopamine antagonism, that's important because if you talk to most uh, neurologists focused in Parkinson's, they would say, wait a minute, you, you, you can't block dopamine um, 
to uh, for Parkinson's patients, that'd be horrible. I think what that highlights is the advantage that a, a non-neurologist has in this field, which is that neurologists uh, have been indoctrinated since the 1970s that if you give dopamine acutely and you give dopamine, you see an acute improvement in motor function. What people in the field don't seem to understand is that there are many examples where the immediate pharmacologic effect and a long-term permissive biologic effect of that pharmacologic agent behave differently or manifest differently. A classic example is something that I learned as a cardiologist when I started the first phase two trial of a beta blocker for heart failure, carvedilol, which is that even though the literature has said that if you give a standard dose of beta blocker, you would cause fluid retention, worsening heart failure. And so they were contraindicated by dosing initially at very, very small doses, one-tenth of the dose, one-twentieth of the dose, and gradually increasing at weekly or twice, you know, two weekly intervals, um, patients would tolerate the drug and over the course of three to four months show reversal of their disease, both functionally, uh, clinically, and from the point of view of cardiac function. So I believe we have a chance with similar cellular biology to realize the same kind of effect. So the second part of this phase two trial program would be to benefit, show benefit on ambulation activity and overall well-being. Uh, I expect that this drug will qualify under this indication for as a breakthrough therapy and eventually accelerated approval. Um, and that a phase three study would be performed with intermediate term outcomes with four to six month outcomes. Whereas in the post-market setting, the effect on clinical progression can be assessed. Now, how can I be so optimistic about this? I can be optimistic because I've already completed the pre-IND process and gotten feedback from uh, the Center for Drugs on the, the clinical trial program that I'm talking about here. In terms of how this would work out from a business perspective, uh, I usually don't like to discuss this in an initial presentation, but whenever pharma people are involved, they seem to want to respond with uh, disinterest because it's a repurposed drug. So let me show you um, how this looks financially as a as a uh, as a, a return by calculating the risk adjusted valuation based on a paper that was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2001, really using their, their method. Uh, the paper includes a downloadable Excel spreadsheet pre-programmed with their equations. So I used this existing model. I did not develop it, but I will show you uh, the assumptions used to account for the risk of failure, uh, the time cost of clinical trials, the addressable market, et cetera. Um, wholesale acquisition cost was assumed to be 3,000 a month at a 50% discount, the max penetration, 40%, 45% of those newly diagnosed. So I'm only focusing on this model on treating patients when they're newly diagnosed, even though this should be an option for those who already have existing Parkinson's as well, whether it goes all the way to severe Parkinson's, clinical trials would have to define. Assume a time to market penetration of seven years and the risk-adjusted net present value is of, of this entity is $32 million. Uh, and that uh, includes a launch revenue of around $59 million the first year, topping out about $500 million in the U.S. So the population of Parkinson's patient is about the same as the, in the U.S. and the EU. And estimates in China are anywhere from three to six times bigger. So you can see why I said this was more than a billion dollar value on an annual revenue basis. I'd like to share with you the timeline of progress to date. I've been working on this um, uh, really as my passion, um, not my day job, but I'm hoping that it will become my day job at some point. Uh, the first stage has been going on for the last couple of years. It started out with uh, the discovery and filing of the IP drafting a protocol, identifying study sites, and working with those uh, experienced PD investigators to get the protocol tuned up. 
uh, going through the pre-IND process with the FDA, which is completed. Now we're entering stage two, which is slated for the next six months. Uh, right Brain Bio was formed as a company, having now gotten uh, indications that the regulatory risk appears to be mitigated. That seemed to make sense. Uh, I'm working now to recruit uh, a scientific advisory board. Um, um, uh, and, and focusing shortly on fundraising to secure $10 million in funding to perform the phase two trials. There are two phase two trials slated, um, which can be accomplished with this much money. And when they are positive, uh, I think the valuation will soar and the interest will as well. I've already been talking to a couple of pharmaceutical companies who are very interested if the initial tolerability data were to, to show that, that my uh, my view that it is tolerated uh, turn out to be true. Um, and then we get into stage three with the funding, which over the next two to three years, we'll be filing the IND, launching the phase two trials, and then preparing for phase three. So we've got a nice trajectory going here. Uh, I'm right here as my current state, um, getting ready to, to gear up uh, to, to pursue the fundraising. So in conclusion, Right Brain Bio is uniquely suited to transform and then lead the Parkinson's market. It's, um, it's always tough to penetrate as a new player, but I think when you're talking about a market which is big, um, which has people suffering, um, and for which there's been no major breakthrough since the 1970s, um, it's a great opportunity. The preclinical data already provide proof of concept that RB190 improves dopaminergic neuron biology and viability. The clinical data um, will show that RB190 is the first therapy that addresses the neuronal excess of dopamine seen in Parkinson's. And I'm referring to the Journal of Parkinson's Disease publication. And as a phase two ready compound, RB190 uh, safety and effect efficacy are demonstrable within two years with $10 million of funding. So I wanna thank you uh, for this opportunity to share this vision and the plan for testing the vision and transforming uh, uh, Parkinson's and reversing disease progression. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Oh, go ahead, Gary. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you so much, Jonathan. I know we have uh, questions that have come in but I'd like to, um, I have a few myself and I'd like to lead off the question. Um, so um, when you're talking about um, intracellular dopamine being toxic, um, why, why is it that the drugs that have been historically used to treat Parkinson's disease, L-dopa, carbidopa, um, why, why would those drugs show any type of beneficial effect? Gary, it's a, it's a great question. And it's one that um, I'm asked generally right off the bat. And, and I think that what it requires is understanding a little bit about pharmacology that most people um, uh, you know, don't really think about typically. So um, the, um, the, there are two things. Number one, I think that it's important to recognize that there's a difference between acute pharmacologic effects and long-term biologic effects. So you can see a, an immediate response and believe this is a great drug because look how this patient can move more. I mean, anybody who sees the somewhat related example of the movie Awakenings um, has a, you know, sort of has that tangible memory of the movie, and if you've treated a patient, you have it as well. But I think what's really interesting is to think, why would levodopa work? And to answer that question, you look at the receptor physiology. So the postsynaptic dopamine receptors are G-coupled proteins. Um, I use G-coupled proteins as the mediator. And, and those types of receptor um, receptors are very well understood. In, in normal patients without Parkinson's, you're operating at a part of the curve on that receptor binding relationship 
where a very small amount of dopamine has a significant effect. As you go on in a disease where there's desensitization from chronically uh, uh, elevated levels, because remember, this is not a state of dopamine deficiency, it's dopamine excess, that what happens is the receptors become desensitized. And now you're operating on a part of the curve where a little bit of dopamine released into the synaptic cleft doesn't do what it needs to do. So by adding a basal amount of dopamine that gets into the synaptic cleft, because you're just driving more L-dopa into the presynapse, uh, the tyrosine hydroxylase creates more, you put out more, even though it's not efficient, that what you learn is that um, you're shifting on a part of the receptor binding curve where then a very, very small amount, which is all that can be released at a time, actually can cause postsynaptic signal transduction. So it's, it's really mm. res taking advantage of the limits and the possibilities of receptor binding curves. Mm -hmm. It makes, um, makes perfect sense when you explain it that way. Um, so thank you. Um, it, are there any risks or potential risks that you could imagine um, in administering RB190 to people with Parkinson's disease. I, I know there are some safety data already available, but um, anything that would concern you about uh, reducing dopamine levels in these patients? Yeah, I, I think that's real important because uh, anyone who does clinical trials is always thinking about what can go wrong. And I think that what can go wrong here if you're, if you're basically taking somebody um, who is more brittle than you think and dropping their dopamine level too quickly or too much is you can make them worse. Now, the beauty of this kind of approach is that you could administer a rescue dose of, of, of Cinemet, of Carbidopa, Levodopa, um, to rescue them because that L-Dopa acts after the rate limiting step that you're inhibiting by using RB190. So there's the opportunity to rescue. Um, it's also possible that despite the fact that I was able to get uh, the medical review from the FDA from 1979 through Freedom of Information and pulled out a, a, a real wealth of, of publications in both animals and people about the pharmacology, that makes me very confident that starting with a dose of 25 milligrams is basically going to do nothing. Um, you still don't want to ever say to somebody, oh, you know, this is no big deal, just go ahead and use it. I mean, after all, the product label for the marketed version of Materazine has a warning saying this could worsen Parkinson's or give you symptoms of Parkinsonism. So, you know, it's sort of like anything. You, if you took a boatload of Tylenol, your liver would not be happy. Um, if you take the right dose, not only does your liver not care, but your fever goes down or your aches and pains are better or your headaches better. Mm -hmm. So we really need to do the studies to prove that the dosing regimen that, that I'm proposing is safe uh, to initiate and then see what the long-term effects are. Mm -hmm. And is, is the dose or are the doses that you would use in phase two, are those already... Um, marketed approved doses, or would you be using a different dose or kind of a different dosing strategy? So the way that the drug is currently approved is as a 250 milligram dose. That's the only dose that's available. And um, it's not something you can divide up. So the dose is generally 250 milligrams four times a day, up to one to two grams four times a day. Uh, to treat patients with hypertension due to pheochromocytoma. So instead of going from 250 four times a day up to two grams twice a day, I'm starting at 25 milligrams three times a day and then going up beyond there, up there to maybe getting to a couple grams in a day, not a couple of grams four times a day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, and it's amazing that, you know, this is uh, something that is really phase two ready um, and also uh, ha has IP that is very well protected. So as you, as you pursue this, um, you, you've got that protection against competitors already locked in. 
Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's, it's really nice. I mean, you know, the, the great analogy is AZT, um, which was developed in the early 1960s uh, against oncogenes to treat cancers. And um, it was shelved because it didn't work. But somebody at, at Wellcome had, a, had the insight that there was a drug, AZT, that affect reverse transcriptase. Let's try it in a model of HIV. It worked. They filed a use patent. They did a quick phase one to two trial at NCI, then did a, a clinical trial. It was approved rapidly in 1987. Um, and that patent, which was filed in 1985, withstood several court challenges and gave welcome 100% market exclusivity till 2005. And, and that's the kind of protection you can get with a repurposed drug. Um, the 250 milligram unit dose that exists is not going to be a factor. I mean, in my pre-IND with the FDA, even though I can read the regulations and knew them from having worked at the FDA, that the use patent would be protective. I actually still asked the FDA as part of my pre-IND questions to confirm that. So I have the FDA's response in writing that yes, mm -hmm you are basically interpreting the uh, regulations correctly and your use patent protects you. Mm -hmm. That's great, great. And um, I don't wanna you know, take up all the time with questions. Uh, Janine, are, I think we have a little bit of time left. Are there any other questions that have come in that um, Jonathan might be able to answer? Yeah, so I have a question here. Um, RB190 sounds like a neuroprotective agent. Does that mean that the endpoint is slowing of progression of disease and not improvement in function? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. I actually think that there's more to it than being neuroprotective because based on the, what's going on from a cell biology point of view, the drug can reverse mitochondrial dysfunction. So I think that what that means amongst other uh, mechanisms that it affects within the cell is that it improves neuronal function. So even though you've lost if you have Parkinson's disease and you're symptomatic, a lot of your neurons already, there are a whole bunch that are there and not functional. And what this will do is reverse the dysfunction. It's similar to what we saw in heart failure where the monoaminergic peptide norepinephrine is toxic to the myocytes. Uh, and in part, it kills the myocytes, the apoptosis, but in part, it shifts the genetic expression. It reduces uh, the production of certain critical contractile proteins, very similarly, the function was reversed. So you give someone a beta blocker with heart failure, their ejection fraction would go from 20 to 26. Not, you know, normal necessarily, but reversing the process. And I think that what we'll be able to demonstrate in these phase two trials is a reversal of dysfunction. Uh, that's how the endpoints are being selected. It's not just the UPDRS questionnaire that's going to be used. Um, and uh, then in the post-market setting, once the drug is proven to improve function, which I think will be shown, um, a, a larger scale study can be done to look at disease progression. A lot, another study can be done on patients with more advanced Parkinson's. So there'll be opportunities to expand the, uh, the indications. Thanks. And Jonathan, there's just one more question kind of in, in follow-up to that question. Um, it says, if your hypothesis is correct, why does L-dopa, dopaminergic agents improve function, at least in the short term? Yeah, and that was what I was trying to get at about how they affect the way the signals are transduced through the G-protein coupled receptors postsynaptically. I think what they're doing is they're shifting um, uh, the where you are on the operating curve for those desensitized receptors to a place where a smaller amount of dopamine being released dynamically uh, in response to say the urge to walk. So the dynamic response then, which is blunted because of dysfunction of the, of the neurons and death of other neurons, um, that small amount can have more effect because you've shifted where you are on the operating curve for those postsynaptic receptors. So it works, then you get further desensitization maybe months later, maybe years later, unfortunately, some people even weeks later, 
uh, you increase the dose of the dopaminergic agent or L-DOPA. And, you know, again, you're trying to stay on that top part of the curve where it's got a favorable response characteristic. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, that's all the questions we have for now. Um, Gary, did you have any other follow-up questions? Um, no, I think um, nothing. <laughs> I get the luxury of having uh, <laughs> the opportunity to talk with Jonathan outside of this. So, um, so nothing more to add to this uh, conference, but I do want to say, Jonathan, thank you so much for delivering this information. It really is a novel paradigm and I think something of interest to those who participated in the webinar today. Um, and uh, I, I presume people can find Right Brain Bio um, on the internet if they were to do a search. They can, you can find Right Brain Bio, which doesn't really have much of a website at this point, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, um, I'd, be, I'd certainly be interested in having any further discussion. There's a lot of data behind this a lot of depth. This was a very superficial look at this opportunity um, that I've gotten into extremely great detail about. So happy to discuss this further with anybody who's interested. That's terrific. Well, thank, thank you again for today, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, thank, thanks, Jonathan. And for anybody listening, we will have the recording. Um, you'll get an email following the event today with a link to the recording. Um, Appreciate your, after, uh, your time today and have a great afternoon.